Hello everybody. Uh, hello everybody. I am Shilpa Joshi and with me is Dr. Bansi Sabu. We are the moderators of this session and uh, welcome to Nodal Update. As the chairperson of Nodal Update, I welcome all of you. Uh, the first talk is going to be by Dr. V. Mohan on are carbohydrates the main cause of diabetes in India? I'm going to introduce one of the most famous person in India. Uh, it's my proud privilege to welcome Dr. Mohan. He is the chairman of Dr. Mohan's Diabetes Speciality Center and president of Madras Diabetes Research Foundation in Chennai. He is also the Padma Shri awardee by Government of India. Uh, there is a lot of other things uh, about him which are there on the slides, which which will take a lot of time. So I request Dr. Mohan to begin his uh, talk, please, so you can start sharing slides. Yes, Can you sir. see the slides? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers, my good friends, Dr. Neeta Deshpande, Dr. Sanjay Agarwal, Banshi Sabu, and all the others who are involved in organizing this uh, a very important meeting, which I understand has broken all records. And uh, I've been amazed to see the number of delegates who have actually joined the session. This, these kind of meetings are new for India because uh, thanks to COVID, I always say that every cloud has a silver lining. And the cloud of uh, COVID, the silver lining is that virtual meetings have taken off in, uh, in a very big way. And therefore, congratulations to all of you. I'd like to thank uh, Shilpa for the kind introduction and Banshi for sharing the session and all the others who have been involved in helping me to get my slides together and so on. In the time allotted to me, I will take up this topic of are carbohydrates the main cause for the diabetes epidemic in India? As you can see, it's a very provocative topic and one may argue, is it the main cause and so on. But I'll try to convince you that at least it is one of the causes, if not the main cause. And I do believe that's one of the most significant causes. So this will be the structure of my talk. I don't have any conflict of interest to declare. All the studies which I'm presenting are funded by government organizations and not by any pharma or anyone else. So this is the structure of my talk. I'll first talk about carbs, which is carbohydrate, in relation to the prevalence of diabetes. So is there any connection between increasing prevalence of diabetes? Sorry? Uh, carbs in relation to prevalence. Can others mute their mic, please? Uh, so carbs in relation to prevalence of diabetes. Then secondly, I'll talk about carbs and the incidence of diabetes, which means the new onset cases, the increase, uh, the actual epidemic itself. Is that related to carbs? And finally, I'll end with the last two or three slides on that not all carbs are bad. There are bad carbs and good carbs. On that note, let me go to the first one, carbs in relation to prevalence of diabetes. As an introduction, I'd like to put up this slide where we have studies in some cities in India, we have repeated studies on the prevalence of diabetes done in proper epidemiological manner using WHO approved methods and published in international, reputed international peer reviewed journals. And Chennai is one such city in the city of Delhi. Also, we have a frequent follow, but Chennai probably has the maximum. So if you look at the 1970s, where about 2% of the population had diabetes in urban India, it soon shot up to 8%, 11, 13, 14, 18, and now it's the latest study in 2014, was 23% of the population in Chennai and 25% of the population, adult population uh, in Delhi have diabetes. Now this is people above 20 years of age. And if you take people who are 60 years of age in Chennai and Delhi, almost 50% have diabetes, another 30, 35% have pre-diabetes, almost 80-85% of the population at age 80 have either diabetes or hypertension. This has actually uh, some relevance to COVID when we hear about COVID deaths more in people with diabetes because older people are dying and at that, at that uh, age group, a lot of people have diabetes. So any disease you take, COVID, non-COVID, you'll find that diabetes is there. Now what has that to do with my talk? Now, my, uh, uh, far, right 1971, when my father's days, right now up to two more generations in the family when you've been following up uh, these cases, uh, the link between diet and the prevalence of diabetes has been studied. And the big question that we're asking is, why did this prevalence go up from 2% to 22%, almost a tenfold increase in about 30, 35 years time? 
obviously our genes did not change. Very tempting to say it's all genetic. So what happened in 71 when we had the same gene? 71, I was alive, my genes didn't change. So what changed was the environment. One of the important things to change the environment is the diet. And so about that we will speak today. I'm not saying it's the only factor. There are physical inactivity, stress, pollution, 100 other things are related to that obesity. But we'll talk about this. This is one of our early papers, 2009, published in the British Journal of uh, Nutrition, where we looked at the dietary carbohydrate in a very large study called as the Chennai Urban Rural Epidemiological Study. This study had 26,000 people on whom we collected uh, data, looked at the prevalence of diabetes by doing OGTTs, and then we also divided the population based on the carbohydrate intake. Those who had the lowest, first, qu first quartile, second quartile, third quartile, fourth quartile. We also calculated the glycemic index, glycemic load, and looked at the prevalence of diabetes in this particular population. And the results are shown here. If you look at the prevalence of uh, diabetes, it goes up uh, from the first quarter, if you take the odds ratio as one, as a reference, it goes up threefold, three and a half fold, and more than fourfold by the time you go from the first quartile of carbohydrate intake to the fourth quartile. Just to remind you, the first quartile of people in Chennai, for example, take about 200 grams of carbohydrate, mostly from rice, whereas in the fourth quartile, it's about 400 grams. So by the time you go from 200 grams to 400 grams, your prevalence of diabetes has gone up fourfold, which means if it is, say, 5% here, it will be 20% there. If it's 8% here, it will be 32% there. So that is the increase that we found. And this is after adjusting for all factors like family history, BMI, age, sex, cigarette smoking, alcohol, physical activity, socioeconomic status, everything has been adjusted for. So if you look at the glycemic index, you can see a similar pattern. Glycemic load, same pattern. And if you look at dietary fiber, an inverse relationship. That means the more fiber you take, less diabetes. So it's a very powerful study uh, showing that there is a, a link between diabetes and glycemic load and carbohydrate. But the question you may say, even after adjusting for all these confounders, there may be other confounders. You really need incident studies to do that. But uh, so the conclusion was from this study in urban South Indians, total dietary carbohydrate and glycemic load are associated with increased and dietary fiber with a decreased risk of type 2 diabetes in the South Indian population. My friend, Dr. Shashank Joshi, who has done the uh, START study uh, in collaboration with many of you, has shown that the carbohydrate intake is the same in, in different parts of the country. And therefore, what is rice in south and east of India will be replaced by, uh, by wheat in the north and west of uh, India. And so you can get similar results there. I will not be surprised if you see that. Now, here is a study from the United States published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition by Lee Gross et al., where they looked at what is the pattern of refined carbohydrate consumption in the epidemic of type 2 diabetes to so an ecological assessment. So shown here, the dotted line is the prevalence of uh, diabetes. And shown here in the bars are, is the intake of carbohydrate. So you can see that as the prevalence of diabetes increases, there is an increase in the carbohydrate load as well. So showing or suggesting that there is a link between the two. But as I said, prevalence studies, there are a lot of confounders which you cannot adjust for. The authors did conclude that increasing intake of refined carbohydrate, in their case it was not rice but it was, or wheat, it was corn syrup, were concomitant with decreasing intakes of fiber, exactly what we showed, paralleled the upward trend in the prevalence of type 2 diabetes in the United States. In the whole country they have studied and they showed it. Pretty powerful data. Now let me go to the incidence of diabetes. Now to calculate incidence of diabetes, it's not easy. Why it's not easy? Because you have to go back to the same population that you studied after 5 years, 10 years, 20 years, and same, study the same people, see those who did not have diabetes, say 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and who have developed diabetes now. And then you go back to the diet that they were taking and see whether there's any correlation with the incidence of diabetes. So these studies are not easy to do. Now let me first show you two, three of the other studies, and then I'll show you our own study and plus a more recent one. So this is in the United States, Carbohydrate Quantity and Quality, published in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition 2015, so it's only five years old, and the risk of type 2 diabetes, incident diabetes. And you can see that as the quintiles of this divided into five, so it's quintiles, not quartiles, so if you see that with the increasing quintiles of starch intake, the relative risk for type 2 diabetes, incident new onset diabetes, increases by about 
18, 20 percent or so. So even in an American population where they don't take so much of carbohydrate. So the authors concluded that diets with high starch and high starch to cereal fiber ratio were associated with a higher risk of type 2 diabetes. Now this is in US women. Okay. Now let us see another study in Japanese men. Now again they looked at dietary carbohydrate intake and presence of obesity or absence of obesity and the incidence. The question they are asking here is, yes carbohydrate may be linked, but is it also true in lean people or is it only in obese people? So here are the results. This is the carbohydrate percentage. And if you look at the carbohydrate percentage here, this is in people without obesity. Okay, so you'll find that without obesity, there's no risk at all. So a very lean person takes carbohydrate, they don't seem to have a risk. But that when you have obesity here, you can see that with increasing percentage of carbohydrate, when it goes from 50% to 65%, you can see the huge increase in the diabetes, new onset diabetes. This is in relation to carbohydrate quantity, not the percentage. So again, in the absence of obesity, 280 grams and 340 grams, you see that there's not such a big increase there in their carbohydrate, not like 400, 600, which we take. So there is no association. But if you look at those with obesity, you can find that there's a clear association. So what they concluded was that in Japanese men, higher carbohydrate intake was associated with a higher risk of diabetes in obese participants, but not in non-obese participants. And so what they said was, those who take more than 65% carbohydrate, if you cut it to 50% or so of carbohydrate, you may help to prevent the development of diabetes. They've not proved it, but they have suggested it. Next comes a study done in middle-aged Chinese women. Now that was Japanese men, US women, now it's Chinese women. I don't know why they select only women and men for studies. I, I feel you should study both. But anyway, so here 64,000 Chinese women, they looked at dietary carbohydrate, glycemic load, glycemic uh, index, and looked at the incidence of diabetes. This is archives of internal medicine. Again, here looks complicated. I'll, divide, I'll make it easy for you. This is BMI on the right side. This is waist tip ratio on the left side. These are people who are normal waist tip ratio. This is increased waist tip ratio. Normal BMI, increased BMI. And then the quartiles of carbohydrate. You can see that there is an increase even in the, those with normal waist tip ratio. But with those in increased waste pressure, it's obviously more. 1.23 becomes 1.38. So 23% increase becomes 38% increase. Again, normal BMI, 22% increase. Increased BMI, 41% increase. Here what they've done, they've looked at rice itself. And I'm going to talk about rice a little later. So rice they've looked at. And if you look at less than 200, more than 300, there is an increase. But we have increased waste pressure, central adiposity. It goes up much more, doubles the risk. And then normal BMI increases 39% with increased BMI increases 100%. So there's a suggestion here that even among the carbohydrate, rice seems to be, polished white rice seems to be of uh, greater importance. So the authors concluded that high intake of foods with high glycemic index and glycemic load, especially rice, the main carbohydrate contributing food in this population may increase the risk of type two diabetes in Chinese women. Now, Emily Hugh is the daughter of the famous Frank Hugh. When she was a school student, you won't even believe it, she's a high school student, she wrote this paper, obviously the same genes as her father. Uh, so she worked, uh, she worked on this and published a paper in the main BMJ, where she looked at white rice consumption and the risk of type 2 diabetes, a meta-analysis and systematic review. This is the only meta-analysis which was done and is published in 2012. Right now with Vasanthi Malik, uh, who was an author on this, I am also working on another systematic uh, review which is being written up uh, as uh, the next 10 years data which has uh, happened. But let's look at what Emily Hugh showed. If you look at the, she has divided a population into Western population who hardly eat any carbohydrate and the Asian population. So Japanese, Chinese, the ones which I showed you. You can see that in the Asians, there is a huge increase going up to almost 55%. Whereas in the Western population, there is no statistically significant increase. This, I think, is because the Westerners don't eat that much carbohydrate. So you don't see the effects when you take a pure white population, you may not see it. Whereas in an Asian population, where we eat more carbohydrate, it comes out. That is why in my title, I said in India. I did not say for the whole world. So I think it's in places where you eat carbohydrate. So Emily Hugh concluded by saying that the higher consumption of white rice is associated with a significantly increased risk of type 2 diabetes, especially in Asian populations. Now, when I was looking at, I, as you know, I am part of the PURE study. The PURE study, the Prospective Urban Rural Epidemiological Study with Salim Yusuf uh, as, the, as the principal investigator from McMaster University, is the largest epidemiological study done in the world period. 
not just diabetes, not just cardiovascular disease. Uh, in this particular study, we had 132,000 patients from 21 countries, from almost all the continents except Antarctica. People were uh, contributing to this. Now we have crossed actually 200,000 patients. We hope to participants. We hope to reach 250,000 participants by the end of this year. So I took up this study. Bhavadharani is my uh, former PhD student who was working with, then moved to Canada, and she is working with uh, was working with Salim Yusuf when we did the study. Uh, so it was my hypothesis. Let's look at white rice in different populations. Remember, in Emily Hughes' study, they only showed it in the Asian population. They did not show it in Asian po others. But then here we have 21 countries, and the number is huge. So we divided our white rice consumption into less than 150, 150 to 300, 350, 400, more than 450. Why did we take 150? One cup of rice. So one cup, two cups, three cups, four cups. And then how many uh, people develop diabetes? About 6,000 people develop diabetes over this nine, 10 year period. And then we looked at white rice intake versus the, um, uh, versus the incident diabetes. This paper is unpublished. It's uh, under second review and it may be accepted this week. I, I request you not to uh, share the, the findings until it is published. So here are the overall results. So if we look at the overall population it was significant. If you take age, the whole world, 21 countries, uh, you can find that white rice increase with a 20% uh, increase in the uh, incidence of diabetes. Now, if you take Asia, again, there is an increase. Take non-Asia, again, there is an increase. So irrespective of whether it is in Asia or in non-Asia, and look at the numbers, 78,000 people in Asia, India, China, Philippines, Vietnam, all these countries. And non-Asia also includes many, many uh, countries. All the other countries uh, which are not listed here as Asia are non-Asia. So a very clear demonstration that white rice, after adjusting for everything, BMI, waist ratio, family history, smoking, location, education, physical activity, energy intake, whole grains, refined grains, fruit, vegetables, center, everything is adjusted. You can't adjust more. Still it is significant. So rice, I think this will be the biggest paper showing that white rice is directly related to incident uh, type 2 diabetes in the world. Now, we also did a spline graph. And why did, where did the spline graph is? The spline will tell you where the risk starts and where it continues. So you can see in the initial part, there is actually a drop. If you are below 100 grams of carbohydrate, there's a lower risk of diabetes. Then it kind of increases, 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 and then comes flat. Somewhere around 150, 300 grams, it becomes constant. After that, it doesn't matter whether it's 400 grams or 500 grams, you already reach the saturation point. So this is what you're able to show again for the first time, a dose response curve was shown. Finally, just last three slides on bad carbs and good carbs. So far, we spoke about the quantity of carbohydrate, but the quality of carbohydrate is also equally important. As we know, there are bad carbs and good carbs. The bad carbs are obviously sweetened drinks, fruit juices with a lot of sugar, highly polished white rice, about which I spoke, white bread, cookies, pastry, cake, ice creams, candy, chocolate, except for dark, dark chocolate, potato chips, and french fries. When I look at this list, I say, oh my God, all the good things in life are bad carbs. And, but unfortunately, you have to restrict these or avoid these. Now look at the good carbs, vegetables. Eat as much as you can every day. Whole fruits, not, uh, not fruit juices, preferably the lower GI ones. Legumes, like kidney beans, peas, lentils, Bengal gram, green gram, black gram, whatever you like. Nuts, walnuts, almonds, hazelnuts, ground nuts, cashew nuts. Seeds like sunflower, chia, pumpkin, whole grains such as brown rice, steel cut oats or quinoa. All these can be included in your diet. So I'm going to conclude here by saying that excess refined carbohydrates are associated with increasing prevalence and incidence of type 2 diabetes. Restricting carbohydrate intake, this is my suggestion, to about 45 zero carb diets and you know paleo diet, keto diets. Uh, Shilpa and I have written several articles on this together. It doesn't work and it's not sustainable. If you just cut it from your 70, 80% to 45% enough, you can eat your own diet, take a little less carbohydrate, add sufficient protein, 20%, take the good fats, which come from monounsaturated fat and polyunsaturated. We just had a paper published yesterday from Harvard showing that uh, mono and polys actually protect, whereas the trans fats and saturated fats are really bad uh, to prevent uh, both diabetes as well as heart disease. I'm going to end there with my last slide thanking you all and giving you all my coordinates in case any of you wish to contact me uh, either uh, through email or through any of my social uh, media platforms, you're more than welcome to do so. So thank you once again and thank to the, thanks to the organizers for allowing me to participate in this wonderful conference. Congratulations once again.
थैंक यू स्टॉप शेयरिंग द स्लाइड सो वी कैन हैव सम क्वेश्चन but sir it's really difficult for many of our patients to restrict the even carbs to the less than 50% even in the starts study also it was even after consulting the patient it was between 60 to 65% of the carbs content what they were eating so you know how to restrict what extra which we can talk to our patient which they have to restrict even you go from north india to south india it is only the rice or wheat which they have the refined flour that is what they are eating so a lot of questions are related to this topic yeah i can do i can suggest three things one is we don't eat enough vegetables particularly in south india we don't eat vegetables at all at least in north india some salad some vegetable they take south india nothing it's so only rice 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 and rasam rice and sadam rice and curd rice and this rice and that sambar that's what they take so what we say is start with some veggies they're going to give you b12 they're going to give you vitamins they're going to give you iron they're going to give you everything so first start with vegetables first second see that you get enough protein if you are a non vegetarian it's easy fish chicken white of the egg lean meat whatever if you are vegetarian you will have to make a conscious effort to take protein either in the form of milk or mushrooms or bengal gram green gram beans peas once you do that already it is quite satiating for you your satiety level will improve on top of that now you take less carbohydrate in between the meals if you can add nuts which are very very filling you won't feel hungry at all one hour before your meal you eat little cashew nut or little ground nut you won't feel hungry at all your appetite will go down 50% plus you got fiber you got protein you got all the good things the good fats you got mono unsaturated fat so by doing this you will have to consciously make an effort then there are a lot of things like soups salads lot of low calorie fillers which you can take in plenty that is going to make your nutrition better same time you won't feel like eating that much of rice and carbohydrate if you keep that in mind then it's easy if not you'll simply put that rice on your plate and the chapatis 3 4 will go then after that you're looking whether any side dish is there that method if you change you can after all we're saying cut it from 70 70% to 50% that is not a big deal it will automatically happen if you replace it with healthy foods so sir one of the doctor from south india only asking what replacement will you give to your patients in breakfast with against the idli and dosa so they can take for example if they want anything which is not white for example if they have a multi suppose they are taking bread let us say multi grain bread they can take idli is not bad idli contains dal and it's good it's a quantity which matters so if they cut down that they add a fruit which along with the idli which is quite filling if they have half an apple already half you're full take a glass of milk which gives you calcium and gives you some protein and then if you have just two idlis it will be fine the problem if you eat five idlis and six idlis only <laughs> excess carbohydrate i showed you the carbohydrate in the lower portion is actually protective only after that it goes up so we are not saying carbohydrate is a poison what we are saying is restricted don't go overboard with 70 80% that's all we are saying in every meal see that some protein comes even if you are vegetarian if you take egg white fantastic you just take two egg whites you won't feel hungry even at 1 o'clock you have your dosa and your idli by 11 o'clock you are already hungry and you are looking for what to eat now so <laughs> anything which is slow release if it's oats then you take you know the high fiber oats you take the bran which contains a bran that will slow it down and reduce your uh, satiety it increase increase your satiety and make you more full then you won't feel like eating it's the carbs when you keep on taking that it gets digested also very fast and your sugar also goes up very fast can i can i ask a question yes. sir Please, yeah. please. So I just had uh, two questions. One is uh, you spoke about rice and uh, um, quinoa and certain other things which you suggested. I wanted your opinion about millets because nowadays people uh, are talking a lot about ragi, jowar, bajra. And another question which has always intrigued me is we talk about higher percentages of carbohydrates, but does a isocaloric substitution, so keeping the calories constant, if you change uh, and calories lower so say just 1000 calories with uh, 50% carbs or 60% carbs or 70% carbs does it really impact or if calories are low it really does not impact um the i'll take the second question first so the there is a lot of debate on this and i don't think the answer is clear there are some people who say that ultimately it all comes down to calories 
And if you are going to not restrict the calories and simply replace carbohydrate with fat, you are not going to get much uh, results out of it because calories are calories are calorie that you cannot forget. But in South and in North and rest of India, where carbs are the main thing, we reduce the carbs naturally, the calories will come down. So to that extent, I think calories are very important. But there is some evidence that carbs by themselves burn out the insulin faster. They increase the demand on the the glycemic load goes up, especially if you use the wrong carbs. Now carbs itself, you can get better types of carbs. For example, in a white rice, you take brown rice or the hand pounded rice or the less polished rice. We have a high fiber white rice which does not increase the glycemic index is low. The fiber content is five times higher. It doesn't increase. So within rice or within wheat is a whole wheat instead of polished wheat. So if you just make the difference between the good carbs and the bad carbs, it's fine. Millets, the same problem. See, in the olden days, when we had millets, the millets were low in uh, glycemic index, very high in fiber. They have good nutrition. Today, what's happening is even the millets are polished. They're polished, polished, polished. So when we look at it under stereo microscope, we've done some uh, studies where we publish them now, showing that the millets which are available in the market, they're all high GI. So the government doesn't like it when we say that this is high GI. No, no, you're not promoting millets. How can you promote it's high GI? You might as well eat rice then. You know, if it is low GI, millets are good. Nutritionally, they're very good. But unfortunately, they're not there. Just like the brown rice you don't get, you don't get the millets which are very healthy. So we must go back to the original what our grandfather and grandmother practiced. If you eat their diet, and if you did physical activity like they did, then we'll have the percentage of diabetes 2% as in 1970s. We did both these wrong. We started decreasing physical activity, then polishing everything, making it looking better, storage of uh, life, half-life becomes better in the shop, so the traders are also happy, everybody is happy, but then disease comes. Obesity comes, calories goes up, insulin resistance comes. That's the price that we have paid for success. Dr. Sabo, do you want to ask any questions? I think now the time is too yeah. You can continue the question for some more time. So, sir, one more question which has come yeah. regarding the breakfast. Can yeah. we reduce the uh, carbs in breakfast, which I normally also, I tell all my patients because, you know, once they take the uh, in carbs in the breakfast, then they get, you know, what you also told at 11 o'clock or 11.30, they again become the hungry. So, this is one of the best way to control the sugar in diabetic patient also because we know that post breakfast hyperglycemia is one of the major issue uh, if we check it and even if you do with ambulatory glucose profile you will find the post meal out of the post meal it is the post breakfast hyperglycemia which is a major issue for our patient but many of the patients they feel that you know they should take uh, a heavy breakfast that the old you know uh, one should have a breakfast like a king and then you know he should eat uh, dinner like a beggar but that's not uh, in the diabetic patients, we see something different. It's it's partly true, Banshi, because in the night, if you eat more, it's going to get uh, not digested. The liver fat will uh, go up and uh, morning sugars will go up. And so that principle is correct. But it doesn't mean that a heavy breakfast is heavy carbohydrate. I yes, would say exactly. a, a breakfast, yes, skipping breakfast, not good. You have to take breakfast. See that the protein comes in. That is what we are lacking in India. The vegetarians, where is the protein? 10% also we are not getting. We are not eating enough protein, much below the recommended dietary allowance. So therefore, protein if you take, vegetarians, they can take it in the form of Bengal gram, green gram, black gram, moong, dal, something. Or oats with, with high fiber. Or add bran to it. Or add fenugreek to it. You add something to it which will lower the glycemic index, increase the fiber. If you, are veget if you are able to take egg, nothing like it, take two or three egg whites, you will skip your lunch. That much your hunger will go. Not only 11 o'clock, even 1 o'clock you will not feel hungry. If you don't take protein, it gets absorbed very fast. Fat and protein have this tendency of, of reducing your, increasing your satiety and preventing hunger. Carbs get digested very fast because that's the fastest conversion to glucose. So therefore, just reduce your carbs at breakfast. Add protein in whichever way you can. It can be milk, it can be egg, it can be anything that you can add. If you're able to do that, it gets more balanced. You're getting your protein intake, your fiber is going up, satiety is going up, sugar won't go up because protein will blunt the postprandial sugar, exactly what you said. And post breakfast is the most difficult time to control. Your need for medicines will come down. You lose weight. I just want to tell you one story. Yesterday I spoke to a great uh, spiritual leader. I was mentioning him just before we started. So this man, he last uh, two months ago, very, very disciplined man. So he uh, kind of uh, came to three months ago 
and he had grade 3 uh, liver changes with when with the elastography already stiffness has come and early cirrhotic changes had come of course i gave him some uh, liver supplements but i told him see the main thing is you lose some weight and then you he said doc next time you see i would have done it and true enough he had lost 8 kilos in uh, 3 months time when i checked his ultrasound completely normal completely normal means from grade 3 to normal in 3 months time I was amazed and I said this kind of some kind of divine intervention, same person, same and my ultrasonologist is fantastic. He will not make a mistake. So he has recorded, he looked the old pictures, he showed me and said, see sir, it's gone. Liver function, his SGOT, SGPT was almost two and a half times normal, completely normal, 18, 20, what 140, 180 has become 18, 20. So SGOT, SGPT became normal, everything became normal, liver changed and I asked him, what did you do? He said, I was taking seven and a half portions of rice for the whole day. I made it one and a half. This, that's it. Complete reversal of liver. Can you imagine? So I said, you should publish this, you know, and you should come on some social media and talk about this. It will be so inspiring. So Banshi was saying it's difficult. Where there's a will, there's a way. Most people give up. They're, they're not, see, this man is disciplined. This is, and he said he does three hours of yoga. Three hours of yoga and pranayama because lockdown. Normally he walks a lot. He said, now I'm not going out. So I transfer, I change it to yoga. Three hours of yoga, cutting the rice from seven and a half portions. I don't know what he means. Seven and a half portion to one and a half portion. Eight kilos weight loss, reversal of diabetes, reversal of liver, reversal of everything. Amazing. Amazing. And he'll sustain it. He's not one of those who'll do it for three months and then leave it. He's a man who'll continue it. So I think where there's a will, it's possible to even reverse diabetes or metabolic syndrome. Do we have time for one more question, Dr. Agrawal? Yes. <laughs> okay. Sir, I had one more question. So uh, you showed uh, in, uh, I think, Japanese data that um, uh, rice consumption uh, or as carbohydrates increase, yes. obese and non-obese, it's different. Is it true for India because we have people with lower BMI but yeah. maybe high body fat? So in the Bhavadarni paper, which I'm writing with the, her, we did not find obesity being, and the reviewers questioned that because it must have gone to the Japanese guy or to uh, Hugh who published the other one. They said, why are you able to explain? I said, see, there's a reverse causality here. We are thinner by nature. So if you compare us with the Americans and Canadians, our BMI is already lower, but our diabetes is higher than what they have, and our BMI is lower. So in that low BMI, uh, we are still seeing the effect of diabetes. So it's not all in above 30 BMI people that we are seeing this effect. We are the thin fat Indians who even at birth we are showing these uh, defects. So I said in Indians we are not seeing that. And in our study obesity was not associated, was not the only, even in non obese people we are able to see. Rice seemed to have a, so we didn't show it in the, I didn't show it in the slides, but when I added physical inactivity on top of that, there was an increase. Definitely there was an increase. And in the cures incident study, which uh, we are, Anjana published as a first author, we showed if you add, in that uh, the, the diabetes care paper from Pure, 23% of the diabetes could be explained by rice alone. 23% of the population at will risk. In Anjana's paper, what we showed us, diet and physical inactivity is 51%. So 51% of diabetes you can reverse by diet and exercise. The rest, of course, is difficult, very difficult to do because there are so many other factors which are also involved. But half of diabetes, if you can prevent, that itself is great. Now imagine how many million people you can reverse. And as I'm saying, it's not only preventing diabetes, those who have got diabetes, who have gone to fatty liver, those who have got almost a cirrhosis stage, reversal. This is something new for me. Even. Thank you. One more question. Dr. Sabu, you want to ask? No, no, you continue. Okay, sir. Sir, another question. We are in summers and mangoes are everywhere. <laughs> and uh, this comes from a dietitian in me completely because um, I just wanted to know you specifically mentioned fruits which are low in glycemic index uh, uh, in your conclusion, uh, the one, one slide before conclusion. And um, so uh, it seems that we have more than whatever, hundreds or thousand varieties of mangoes across the nation. Uh, where I live, Alfonso is the king of mangoes, as they call it, very sweet. And we do, I mean, Dr. Sabu will agree with me, we do see a lot of spikes in blood glucose post uh, eating mango. So what is your opinion about not only mangoes, but in general, the whole WHO thing, five uh, servings of fruits and vegetables, uh, in five which there servings. are three vegetables and two fruits. 
the three, the five uh, fruits and vegetables are not for people with diabetes. That is for a general population, non-diabetic population. For example, I take more than that. I take four or five fruits itself and two, three, at least eight uh, fruits and vegetables I take per day. But I don't have diabetes, so that is okay. In a diabetic patient, I think we should restrict whichever fruit they take. Within that, go to the low GI ones, apple or guava uh, or oranges or papaya, watermelon. So these are the ones with lower glycemic index. Mango, definitely, although they say mango has lower glycemic index, and some people say that, but I, I entirely agree with you and Banshi that we see huge increase in sugars after uh, the mango season. But that does not mean that mango is a bad fruit. See, mango has so many good things uh, in it. Take less of it. Okay, during the mango season, replace your apple or whatever else with mango. Don't eat two mangoes a day or three mangoes a day. Take half a mango a day or quarter mango a day, a few pieces, restrict to that. So you still got your mango, the craving will not be there. And the glycemic load, at that time you reduce a little bit of carbohydrate, you cut down. You take one idli less and take one or two pieces of mango or three pieces of mango. I think it will compensate to some extent. So it is not that you should not take it. For a non-diabetic person, mango is also a very healthy fruit because it, it contains a lot of nutrients which are also there. Yes. In diabetic patients, yes, uh, banana and mango and jackfruit and some sweet grapes and chikku and these kind of things are extremely sweet and they can increase the sugar. So better to restrict them. Be very fond of it. Take it, cut off the rest and cut down somewhere else. Increase your exercise a little bit. So it doesn't mean you should not have your Alfonso. <laughs> the session can be closed. The session can be closed. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. Sir. Great. Thank you for an interesting Great. session. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks Sanjay. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks.